There are three world famous sisters. You might have heard of them. Rhythm, harmony and melody. In the grand scheme of history, rarely have they ever been played by one man. But every few decades, sometimes centuries, there comes along a maverick, a genius, some might even say a god amongst men, who binds these three sisters to his will. And in return, they will usually hand over to such a person the keys to the greatest prize of all, the hearts and minds of men. Because nobody, red, yellow, black, white, nobody can resist the power of music. But who was the first Don Juan to tame the three great muses, whose name did millions across borders, countries, even empires, first call out in a frenzy of song and dance? Travel back in time and listen to the story of a being some called a dog and others called a djinn. This is the account of a phenom who rolled the rise and fall of empires like Simbad rolled the seven seas. This is the story of the man, the Moor, Ziryab. It's 700 AD, Rome is ashes. Out of those ashes stands an empire called Byzantium. But Byzantium too is burning. Beset by a new confederation of peoples from Africa, Arabia and the Levant, bound precariously together by Islam, the world of white emperors is crumbling. The Umayyad Caliphate, a new beast rising out of this sea of disparate peoples, now reigns over southern Turkey, all of Syria, Israel and North Africa. The Umayyads have even begun to expand into Spain under the control of one Tariq ibn Ziyad and his famed army of black soldiers. But the same as with rises, falls can be just as spectacular and unexpected. At its height, the Umayyad dynasty is overthrown by the Abbasids, or as they were known to their Chinese adversaries, Heye Dashi, the black-robed Dashi. Dashi means Arab, but the Abbasids are not Arabs. Influenced by Islam, they might have spoken and written in Arabic, but in fact, they are a people emerging from the ruins of an older force. The Abbasids are merely the latest in a long line of reincarnated Babylon. Baghdad, Iraq is their home. Against this reawakened force and after nearly a hundred years, Umayyad domination comes to a brutal end. Umayyad slaves and servants are slaughtered. The Caliph's harem is not spared as the blood of concubines is shed freely. And even children, potential scions whose existence threatens the black flag of the Abbasids, are beheaded. One man escapes. Abd al-Rahman is his name son of an Umayyad prince and general. Historical accounts tell us a 20-year-old Al-Rahman fled Damascus with his sisters, his brother Yahya, his four-year-old son Sulaiman, and his free Greek servant, a man named Badr. They attempt a daring journey down into Egypt and across North Africa to Tunisia, then known as Ifriqiya. Only Al-Rahman and his servant Badr reach their intended destination. Al-Rahman loses his four-year-old to his pursuers and his brother Yahya is beheaded on the other side of the river Euphrates. Though he hears the death gargle from Yahya's open throat, Al-Rahman barely looks back as he swims for dear life. Ashore, he runs till exhaustion. Against all odds, Al-Rahman not only reaches the court of Ibn Habib, governor of Ifriqiya, but through a series of remarkable events, crosses over to Spain marshals a force of Yemeni warriors to defeat the governor of Cordoba, Yusuf ibn Habib, and makes himself the first emir of Cordoba. Al-Rahman, or Al-Dakil the immigrant, as he became known during his years of exile, becomes Al-Rahman the first of Cordoba and establishes the last stronghold of the Umayyads in what is today Spain. The emir's 32-year reign is one of splendor and struggle. He builds the mosque of Cordoba, which today is the cathedral of Cordoba. But to the south, the Abbasids are knocking at the gates of his new kingdom. Still further south, he banishes them, back across the Mediterranean to North Africa. But the Abbasids are not easily defeated. They are relentless. Employing the most Machiavellian of tactics, they wage an all-or-nothing campaign against the last 
of the Umayyads, even allying with the Europeans north of Cordoba, the armies of the great Charlemagne. When Al-Rahman I dies, his sons take up this forever war. Hisham I of Cordoba reigns for eight years before his son Al-Hakam takes over, after whom the mantle falls upon a man the world will know as Abd al-Rahman II, warrior and philosopher king, the fourth emir of Cordoba. Al-Rahman II was a man who struck fear in the hearts of all and sundry, not least his would-be Christian usurpers. They were left resorting to paintings and sculptures of make-believe battles in which Al-Rahman II is bested by an appearance of Saint Thomas fighting on behalf of the Spaniard king Ramiro I of Asturias. These paintings and sculptures still exist today. They bear testimony to the description of Abd al-Rahman II by medieval historian Ibn Idari in his famous history of the kings of Al-Andalus. There al-Rahman II is described as being quote, tall and brown, a lighter shade of the quote, black his father was described as. In al-Rahman II, the black had no doubt been washed down as could only be expected, seeing as his mother was recorded as being a mixed race woman or quote, a mualad. None of this surprises the reader of history who accepts that the Moors were largely just as described again and again by antiquity's greatest authors and in the dictionaries of the Enlightenment and the 19th century. Procopius in a history of the wars, quote, black skinned like the Moors. From Eli Levita's 16th century dictionary, quote, Moor, Ethiops. And from Samuel Johnson's seminal 1755 dictionary, quote, Moor, Latin Mauros, a Negro, a Blackamoor. Rudiments aside, once Emir al Rahman II wants desperately to show the Abbasids that he is not just their superior on the battlefield, he plans to show them that in intellect, class, and taste, he has blue blood driving through his veins, that he is the rightful heir to the empire they stole from his great grandfather. And so he sets about building a Cordoba befitting. He commissions public works and erects great monuments, adding more colonnades to the Mosque of Cordoba. Medieval and Moorish historian Ibn Hayyan in his famous work al muktabis would later point out that, quote, The Emir Abd al-Rahman II was the first of the caliphs who glossed over the monarchy in Al-Andalus, clothed it with the pomp and majesty and conferred a reverential character, choosing men suitable for functions. These men were the great and the good of their day, scholars, architects, artists, poets and musicians, and one of them was a man making a final desperate roll of life's dice when he wrote to the Emir of Cordoba for a second time. That man was Abu al-Hassan Ali ibn Nafi, known to his friends and foes as Ziryab. Many have called Ziryab a slave who hailed from Iraq. On both counts, they are incorrect. Yes, he is recorded as being referred to in one near contemporary account as Abid Aswadi, in English, a black slave. But this most likely was an attempt to denigrate a man who had his enemies in almost equal measure as his friends. In truth, Ziryab is described by most accounts as a mullah of the second Abbasid Caliph Al-Mahdi Muhammad ibn Abi Jafar al-Mansur. That word Mawla is the same word used to describe Badr, the Greek servant who served the patriarch of the Cordoba Emirate, simply meaning a free servant, client or accompanier. Indeed, it was not strange for a Mawla to achieve great wealth and authority of his own, so long as he played his cards right with his patron. It seems that Ziryab was doing just this until he ran afoul of an envious eye in the royal court at Baghdad. Several accounts exist of this fall from grace, but something close to the truth can be deciphered when the accounts are carefully pieced together. In Baghdad, Ibrahim al-Masili is Ziryab's teacher in the arts, in music, poetry, astronomy, all the essentials a man of intellect needs to flourish in the court of the caliph. Except that Ziryab's talents, particularly with music and poetry, starts to get him noticed a little too much by the caliph. Too much for his teacher's liking. A classic tale of the student exceeding his master is unfolding before Al-Masili's eyes, and this is not a tale Masili particularly cares for. 
everything he has worked for seems to be disappearing right before his eyes and all because of an interloper, a black man whose true origins are far from Baghdad. The last straw for al Masili seems to come when Ziryab overplays his hand and allows something like hubris to overtake him. Moorish and Arab scholar Ibn Abid Rabi in his famous verse The Unique Necklace describes the incident. Perhaps in a bid to shame al Masili for his increasing ill treatment, Ziryab sings before al Masili and the Caliph's court verses of the Hanging Odes, the work of Antara ibn Shaddad, the Ethiopian warrior poet. Quote, this is indeed my mother, black as a raven, from among the sons of Ham. For this you have maligned me, yet I am adept with flashing sword edges and with dark spearheads when you come to me. Were it not that you fled on the day of tumult, I would have bested you in battle." Close quote. The Caliph and his courtiers applaud, appreciating the double-edged recital as a great example of one-upmanship. But Ziryab's is a pyrrhic victory, a disaster in truth. Al-Masili is not amused. Ziryab has made a mortal enemy and a very powerful one at that. In a fit of rage, accounts tell us Al-Masili strikes and threatens Ziryab with death should he remain in Baghdad till morning. This happens probably in private and not before the Caliph as the drama-hungry accounts suggest. Realizing his actions were impetuous and short-sighted and that his charms and grace are no match against the influence of al Masili, Ziryab flees Baghdad. We don't know when exactly, but at some point he arrives in Ifriqiya and resolves to making a living there. But the rulers of Ifriqiya are vassals of the Abbasids, and to seek to ply his high trade in the court of Ziyadat Allah permanently would have been too risky for Ziryab, especially when sources from the time remark that he had begun to offend the temperamental governor with some of his edgy verse. In Ifriqiya, Ziryab is on borrowed time. He could go south, deeper into Africa, into territory unknown to him and risk obscurity. Or he could go back east, see whether the dust has settled in Baghdad and if time hasn't healed old wounds. But sometime in the 820s, still in his youthful prime, Ziryab has a stroke of genius and carves out a third option for himself. Knowing the very recent history of the Umayyads of Cordoba and their sworn hatred of the Abbasids, he sets off for Spain. Once in the famed Al-Andalus, he takes ink to parchment and sends his own servant with a daring message to Al-Aqam I. Medieval scholar Ibn Hayyan tells us that, quote, The singer Abu Mansur was the messenger of Master Ziryab, the singer, to the Emir al-Hakam. It was he who carried Ziryab's message. What exactly was in this message is anyone's guess. But Ziryab is a shrewd operator. We learn of this from much of Ibn Hayyan's writings. Ziryab's story is one that closely mimics the first Emir of Cordoba's, al-Rahman I's Trail of Tears. By now, everyone in the Muslim world and in Christendom knows the famous underdog story of the Umayyads' last stand in Cordoba. In Dinal Andalus, does Ziryab play up the peril he faces in Abbasid-dominated lands? Most likely. Does he talk up his admiration of what the Umayyads have accomplished in the face of the traitorous Abbasids? Almost certainly. But here is another idea. Knowing that the Emir hailed from strong black Berber stock, a man renowned for his own stark black complexion, Ziryab might have reprised the story of his recital in Baghdad and told of how his extraordinary blackness had been something of a handicap amidst the fairer-skinned Abbasids. We know of Ziryab's color from numerous extant sources and can therefore estimate that in origin he was probably from the plains of Ethiopia or modern-day Sudan, where today some of the world's darkest colored people reside, even by African standards. Ibn Hayyan tells us that, quote, Ziryab was a nickname given to him in his homeland because of his black collar, his eloquent tongue, and the beauty of his features. They named him for a black songbird found there because of his resemblance to it. End quote. There's more that Ibn Hayyan tells us, chiefly that Ziryab's letter to Al Hakam is a success. The music loving Emir has heard of Ziryab and is convinced he will be a boon to his court. So he sends for the blackbird, but almost as soon as Ziryab lands in Cordoba, devastating news reaches him. Al-Hakam I has become Al-Hakam the Dead. Ziryab cannot turn back, he's in too deep now, 
with nowhere to go except forward. Ibn Hayyan, quote, So he stopped and wrote to the Emir Abd al-Rahman II, who ruled after al-Hakam, expressing his condolences and describing to the new Emir his situation and his intention of travelling to him and the hopes he placed in him after the death of his father. Close quote. A final gambit by Ziliab, and it pays off. Ibn Hayyan again. Abd al-Rahman answered him solicitously, saying that he would be pleased to receive him, urging Ziliab to hasten to him and promising him a good position in his service. So upon receiving these most auspicious of signs, Ziliab sped towards him. Close quote. He would have done. Put not your trust in princes, said one king, but if you do, make sure you get to them before they die. Ziliab was not about to make the same mistake twice and waste one more second in gaining the favour of another powerful benefactor. Whatever were his hopes, he could not, in his wildest dreams, have imagined the success that would greet him at the court of the Emir. Abid Arakman was utterly delighted and welcomed Ziliab's arrival, offering him luxurious lodgings, giving him preference and priority. Ibn Hayyan In the court of the Emir of Al-Andalus, Ziliab finds a place where the arts are allowed to flourish. The nobles, even the king, are men of open minds, thirsty for knowledge and new ways of doing things. In Al-Andalus, Ziliab finds that he might just finally be at home. Might. It is a dark irony that today many of those from the land Ziliab fled in tears because of the colour of his skin now claim him wholesale, saying that he was Iranian, a Kurd or Iraqi in origin, but certainly no more. This irony gets darker, all pun intended, for many of those same voices can today be heard viciously denouncing the claims that Ziliab was a black man whose ancestors probably made their way to Baghdad in chains before later being freed. They give out the usual frenetic cry that in citing historical accounts and descriptions, the ever-dreaded Afrocentrists are at work again, under every bed and in every cupboard. It hasn't occurred to them yet to accept Ziriab both as a man of African ancestry and an Iraqi by birth. Whatever their motives in denying the readily available historical accounts of Ziriab, they may be right in one claim they make, that Ziriab meant the golden one. Ziliab's more common nickname, that of Blackbird, might well have been conflated with the word Zer, which was Persian or Kurdish in origin and which some historians tell us properly meant golden one. Ibn Hayyan may not have been conversant in Kurdish or Farsi when he wrote his great work on Ziliab and thus assumed Ziliab meant the same thing as his more popular Arabic moniker of Blackbird. Interestingly, the two are not entirely dissimilar in sound, Shahar being the Arabic for blackbird and Zer being the word for gold in Kurdish. One thing is certain, just as with the name blackbird, the golden one proved to be an apt name for Ali ibn Nafi, because in Cordoba, Ziriab shone just like gold. Al-Rahman II has favourites who compose music and poetry and perform regularly before him and his courtiers. Ibn Hayyan names them. Among them were the singer Abu Yaqub, the two Hassans Hassan Hal Hili and Hassan Al Karawi, Mansur the Jew, and others. Close quote. Ziriab supplants them all. Quote, These were the most prominent of his singers until Ziriab the Iraqi came to him. He was the master of singing, the wonder of Al Andalus, who became the Emir's favourite and conquered his heart. Abd al Rahman elevated him above all others who practised this profession, male and female." Close quote. So far, Ziliab has proven himself a man who makes fortune bend to his will. Beginning life as the son of the enslaved, he has gone from zero to hero in the land of the Abbasids, then back to zero after running afoul of a malicious adversary. Undeterred by those infamous imposters, triumph and disaster, on another facet of the globe, Ziriab has writhed his way upwards once again and is now the apple of the eye of the Lord of Spain. In Cordoba, he is showered with gifts, jewellery, the finest clothes, slaves, servants and land. Ibn Hayyan wrote that al-Rahman's generosity to Ziriab, quote, 
granted him privileges far beyond those given even to beloved guests and the closest, most trusted viziers. This favoritism does not go unnoticed. Whispers turn to murmurs. Has Ziria bewitched the Emir with magic as black as his skin? Easy to ridicule these suggestions today. But was there some truth to the rumours of sorcery in Al-Andalus? Or is Ziryab's success the rightful reward of a man not afraid to experiment with his music, a man unafraid of the opinion of others in the pursuit of his art, a free spirit unconstrained by the norms of his time? In short, is Ziryab a mad genius or is he in league with the devil? Believe it or not, both could very well have been true. Over a thousand years later, a modern expert on Ziryab would write this, quote, his arrival at the court of Cordoba in the year 822 is the beginning of an Andalusian musical tradition distinct from the Eastern musical traditions of Mecca, Medina, Damascus and Baghdad. And he is popularly credited with the creation of the Narba or sweet form, which is the basic structure of the Andalusian musical traditions of modern North Africa. He is said to have memorized the lyrics and melodies of 10,000 songs and to have composed innumerable songs of his own. He developed new techniques for teaching the art of singing and added a fifth string to the Arab lute. In short, he single-handedly crafted a style and repertory that became the foundation for all Andalusian music from the 9th century to the present. Close quote. Dwight F. Reynolds Others have stated that Ziryab's musical madness led him to fuse traditional Indian and Iranian music with the music of North Africa, the result of which was the creation of the famous Andalusia beat based on the Cantao. This, they say, was the precursor to the famed flamenco. And then there are those who knew Ziryab, and what they swore about him was that this was no earthly talent, but a gift from the jinn. Great spirits of Islamic folklore known sometimes for their treacherous trickery and other times for their benevolence. If these creatures dealt with Ziryab, then they seemed to offer him benevolence. This from Ibn Hayyan's scrolls. Ziryab had complete mastery of the skills of the craft of singing in his understanding of the details of music theory. None among the practitioners of this art surpassed him. They were simply blind in that which for him had been revealed. He combined his own innovations to what he had learned from one master to the next. He was one of a kind, for God had brought together in him what he had scattered among the other people of his field. It is even said of him that the jinn would teach him every night. He would leap up suddenly from his sleep and call for his two excellent singing slave girls, Gijlan and Hunaida, to take up their lutes and he would pick up his own. He would transmit to them what he had been inspired with that night and he would write out the poetry for them and perfect the crafting of the song. The two of them were called Ziryab's two registers and after his death, they entered the service of the palace to teach the other singing slave girls. There they spread this story about their late master and what befell him during these secret whisperings from the jinn and maintained that it was true. Whatever the truth behind Ziryab's musical genius, it paved the way for him in Cordoba. He became a close advisor to al rahman II in matters of culture, art and more even. Transported back in time to the court of al rahman II, a modern observer might well have confused Ziryab for the emperor of Al-Andalus himself. Such was the power and influence yielded over to Ziryab and the whispering nobles of Cordoba. They had no choice but to follow suit. While women desired him, men desired to be him. Just as we today are fixed on the lives of celebrity, the musical and theatrical stars of our day, so was Spain in the 9th century fixed on Ziryab's every move. Before his arrival, the people of Al-Andalus were recorded as having generally kept long and dishevelled hair. But Al-Makari, an Egyptian writer of the Renaissance, writes that when the courtiers of Cordoba saw the coiffure worn by Ziryab, his sons and his womenfolk, they embraced it for themselves and for their servants. Whether you believe the multiple accounts from his time as history or the makings of a myth, that is the history reader's prerogative. But those same accounts also credit him with advances in applicable chemistry 
Litharge, a derivative of lead, was used by Ziryab as a non-staining deodorant. The toxicity of this strange alchemy notwithstanding, Cordovans apparently lapped this up too. The first recorded use of toothpaste in Western Europe? From a scented mixture Ziryab used on his teeth. This too, the emir took a liking to. Even his eating habits were thought wise by the king. Ziryab is credited with bringing the concept of a meal eaten in three separate courses to Europe. But before such a meal was laid out, the king and his nobles paid heed to Ziryab's practice of using leather and not silk as tablecloth, a material which allowed for much easier cleaning after use. When they were done eating, Ziryab's new plaything, a checkered board with stone figures moved to and fro across it, seemed to be Ziryab's favourite pastime. Modern author Robert W. Labeling Jr. writes that the Indian philosophers who Ziryab introduced to the king's court are the first to teach chess in Western Europe. Ziryab's accomplishments in Spain reel off the tongue almost endlessly. Now you might just be forgiven for thinking everybody is pleased. Not so. Human nature never changes, whether you are in Iraq, Spain or Timbuktu. For in Cordoba, just as in Baghdad, Ziryab's success begins to provoke the ire of the jealous. Abu Marwan ibn Razin, a contemporary and eyewitness of Ziryab's, describes him and his relationship with the Emir disparagingly in a poem, calling Ziryab a dog and black as a raven. Quote, Thanks to those who have debased silk by leaving it in the mouths of dogs, who put black perfume on the temples of a man black as a raven. Close quote. No doubt some joined Ibn Razin's ranks and added to the negative intrigue surrounding the Golden One. In turn, Ziryab begins to see treachery everywhere, not least from Abdallah ibn al shamir ibn Numair, himself an accomplished member of the king's court and a favourite of the emir. A comedian par excellence, al shamir makes one too many jokes at the expense of Ziryab and history duly repeats itself. Except this time Ziryab is the persecutor and not the persecuted. Ziryab demands from the emir that Ibn al shamir be punished and the emir, ever under Ziryab's spell, throws al shamir in prison. But unlike his adversaries, Ziryab has a streak of empathy running through him. He is entreated by Shamir's friends to speak favourably to the emir on Shamir's behalf and Ziryab, probably remembering his own humble beginnings, relents. The emir releases Ibn al shamir both him and Ziryab are brought to a delicate truce. Till one day, al shamir crosses his bounds again. This time, al shamirs fate seems sealed. Drawing from varying versions of the incident, Ibn Hayyan once again provides the most fluid account. Not long thereafter, the emir Abd al-Rahman rode forth with his entourage to al rusafa and ascended from there to the foot of the mountains intending to hunt magpies. He carried on his arm a sparrow hawk of his that was skilled in hunting them, but he was unable to find any. Finally, he said to his companions, whoever brings me a bird shall receive whatever he decides as a reward. So Ibn al shamir came rushing towards him saying, O oh, Emir, don't wear yourself out searching for a magpie, for there's one right here next to you. The Emir replied, where? al shamir replied, Ziryab of course. If one were to daub his buttocks and his armpits with a bit of white cheese, he'd turn out as black and white as a magpie. An awkward silence follows. And then, a chuckle. Quote, the emir was overcome with laughter, and he said to Ziryab, This shows you that buffoonery and shamelessness are part of Ibn al shamirs very nature, and neither desire nor fear can rid him of them. What do you think, Ziryab? Whether the emir was entirely unwitting of an attempt to humiliate Ziryab, or whether a brilliant act of diplomacy on the emir's part, in his response the emir seemed to have saved al shamir from Ziryab's anger. It is as my lord has said, replies the blackbird. I call as witnesses God and all those present with us, that I will not hold him to account ever again. Let him say what he wills. All's well. That ends well then, because Ibn Hayyan writes that later, quote, Ziryab and al shamir were reconciled through friendship and good company, close quote. Map out the course of Ziryab's life and you can draw a full circle. In an amazing story cited in the medieval work Al-Muqtabis, 
Another famous singer of Ziryab's day, Aluya, is reported as having sat to eat with the Abbasid Caliph on his visits to Syria. The two sit down to eat inside a glimmering room at a palace that once belonged to the Umayyads. After the meal, Aluya is asked to sing something for the Caliph and out of Aluya comes the following words. If only the Banu Umayya were around me now, the men I see speaking would not speak. Close quote. Gasps and prayers of intercession fly upwards from the lips of those present. Aluya is insane, they must have whispered. Why would a man of his rank dare to summon in song the sworn enemies of the Caliph in such a warm light and in the presence of the Caliph himself? Perhaps Aluya has a death wish, and death seems sure. But no, Aluya's daring Zirab-esque play soon becomes apparent. Aluya himself records that the Caliph looked at him angrily. God curse you, spits the Caliph. God curse you and the Banu Umayyah. I realized that I had made an error and so began apologizing for my mistake, says Aluya. I said, O oh, commander of the faithful, do you blame me for mentioning my former masters, the Banu Umayyah? Ziryab, your former client, is now with them in Al Andalus. He rides forth in an entourage of more than 100 servants and possesses 300,000 dinars, in addition to the lands he owns. While I, here among you, am dying of hunger. Close quote. Ibn Hayyan doesn't tell us if Aluya's play for better means is successful or not, except to imply that he keeps his life. That is another story altogether. What matters is that even as far away from Spain as Syria, news of Ziryab's exploits had flown. In the end, Ziryab the Blackbird, like all men, dies. Even the jinn cannot give eternal life. Cordoba buries him and mourns the passing of a legend. Centuries later, al makari would write, quote, There never was, either before or after him, a man of his profession who was more generally beloved and admired. Close quote. Ah, but little did al makari know that Ziryab would be the first in a long line of blackbirds to dazzle the world with hypnotic rhythm captivating harmony and sirenic melodies. All hail the trill and the black, Ziryab. Thank you for watching to the end. If you're new to the channel, then go ahead and check out our other exposés on unexplored black history and look out because there's more coming. So subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified for our next video. Please also hit the like button to give this video a chance of being seen by more people. If you'd like to support us in a bigger way, you can officially join our production team and become either a scholar, a soldier or sage by clicking join below. To those who are already producers, we say a big thank you with special thanks to Black Rampage 2. We are Black Gone Global. From Kush to Compton, this has been Trill Black, no doubt.